Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah, Earth is yellow. Let's go. You should say, great morning. Great morning. That's awesome what Bertha morning. would say. Absolutely. Stinking awesome Stinking morning. Stinking awesome day. You know why? Because it's his birthday. That's not it's why his it's birthday. a great morning. Oh. The sun is shining beautifully Yeah, outside. you can give him a hand. Yeah, that's a lot yeah, of years no. of greatness. It's good. Woo. Thank you. Thank you. But it, it, it's a great morning because we're here together worshiping God. Thank you so much for coming today. As you come in, you look around, you see the banners hanging around the on the outside, at one banner for every upward basketball or cheerleading team we had this fall. There's 36 banners up there. 36. Absolutely amazing day yesterday. Thanks to Shane for bringing the message at halftime. It's our last week of games. So thank you all so much. We'll do our celebration this week. So if you just continue to keep us in your prayers for one more week, and then you can keep praying, but you can change your focus to seeds being planted growing and more seeds planted coming up in football season so yes if you are a guest with us today we want to say a special welcome to you uh if you would take the tear off part of the bulletin fill it out drop in the offering plate or take it out to the welcome center helps us get to know you a little bit better and also for any of you that's always a great place to write your prayer request and if you are not wearing a name tag then while we're talking, that would be a great time for you. There's a table right back here, or there's one out in the atrium to go get it. If you know what color you are, then getting that color helps other people when they see you. You can have two colors because you can be 50-50. Yeah. Or you can I'm have one 90, color. I'm 95% green, and I put that little blue triangle there because I'm 5% blue. There so, So... It's just a, a way for us to, again, to get connected and everything else so the name tags are in the back. Make sure that you get one of those so that our new folks and the folks who don't know you can know you. Be awesome. Ooh, it is. So what's going on? We got so much going on, you know, upward yesterday. And so uh, the idea that all these kids in here, but Kids Club starts tonight. So yeah. on the West End, 6 p.m., K through 5, our Kids Club program starts tonight. So anybody you know kindergarten through fifth grade, please invite them, try to get them here. They're going to learn about the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So basically the gospel message of Jesus to get that foundation built. So it's going to be awesome. It will be off the hook. It will indeed. And then for our older kids, right, teenagers, we've moved from last Friday, which is when we were scheduled to have our potluck, but the weather did not cooperate. We've moved it to this Friday. So teenagers, after pastor's Bible study on Friday at 11.15. We'll be meeting across the hallway. Main dish provided. You're welcome to bring a side or a dessert or just come and enjoy the fellowship. Lemon Lush. Oh, good stuff. Birth used to make you Lemon Lush and you just had to show up for the Lemon Lush. It was That's great, it. but there's mm-hmm. so much good food. Also, <laughs> That's good stuff. Also, <laughs> next week, parents of all students, junior high through high school that will be going on the summer trips. We're having a meeting for all parents just to come together as a community of believers and understand the mission behind what we're doing to lift our kids up That's at 1 p.m. in the Student Life Center. So parents meeting for mission trips this summer in the Student Life Center. That's awesome. It's awesome. Do you know who I see sitting out there? I do know who you see. You do know. I see see right over here. It's in my peripheral. Yep. Yeah, I see Rainy Schindler. Rainy Rainy's going to come up and share with us a little bit about the women's tea that's coming up. That you can get complimentary tickets in the office, but you need to go get a ticket, right? Do you want this or you want that? Doesn't you can matter. Have, we'll just let you have whatever you want. Woo. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. All right. Some of you guys have come to the ladies' tea before, so you know kind of what I'm talking about. But it's going to be on March 28th at 2 o'clock. Please come. I'd love to have all of you get out your good china set a table, or if you don't have good china, don't worry about it. Invite all your friends, fill up a table with your friends, or come alone. That's fine, because we'll set you in with some other really nice people. Um, We'll have a light refreshment. It will be a wonderful time, and I hope all of you can make it. It's 2 o'clock to 4.30. Thank you. Sounds awesome. And, And if they want to, 
They can go to the office and sign up and sponsor a table. I mean, there are lots of things they can do. Right. This is actually free of charge. We'd like you to have a ticket so we know how much to prepare. So the office has the tickets. Um, I don't have any yet, but I will from today on. I will have tickets as well. So um, please come. Please feel comfortable. Uh, sponsoring a table just means that you bring your china, you decorate it, you put a centerpiece on it. It's, it's not a difficult thing to do. It's just fun. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, Randy. Thank you, Randy. Ooh, Ooh, tea. It'll be awesome. Yeah. And just so we don't lack anything, we also have the Women's Conference coming up right here, here April 25th, and you can sign up for that at the featured ministry table. So the crazy thing is it's all ages. I mean, we've got kids, we've got youth, we've got older kids, we've got tea, we've got colors, everybody connecting. That's kind of like church. You know, everybody brings their gifts together with their colors and plugs it in so that they can make others better. That's kind of what we're called to do, right? Authentic oh love of God for others. Oh, that's good stuff. Kind of like the coffee bean talk from yesterday mm, that you gave. Bean. Love coffee. You got to be able to change the environment. Don't let the environment change you. What an awesome day it is. We want to thank you. Always, always, always make sure you take time to read your bulletin. Read your bulletin. Check the featured ministry table out. There's a lot of things going on. With that, we're going to invite you to do a quick greet, maybe a hand wave or an elbow bump to one another, to remain standing for opening him. For a thousand tongues to sing. This was written by Charles Wesley on the first anniversary of his conversion to Christ. He was delivered from alcohol and from a very bad temper. And from that point on, he never had to bother with it because it was gone. God took it from him. Um, also, I wanted to share with you that. Um, this song, O oh, Four Thousand Tongues, was written, as I said, on the anniversary of, the, of, of his first year of being converted and being without alcohol and a bad temper. And he doesn't have any big thing that I can tell you, a big dramatic story. I can tell you that as he went about his life, constantly he, he was doing hymns in his head. God would give him these songs and he one time he went to his his friend's house and he got off his horse and he said ink and pen ink and pen because he had to get that written down so he would have it so what a what a marvelous marvelous way god can just create people that can be so gifted and so amazing uh, what what he did so let's sing oh for a thousand tongues to sing Woo! 
tie that binds. Just one verse. Blessed be the Father God, you are an awesome God. Father, we do thank you so much, so much for this beautiful day. Father, we thank you for the sun that shines on the outside. Father, we thank you for the sun that shines on the inside. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to join here together with one another. Father, to share with one another the blessings and the excitements of the past week to share our burdens with one another, our prayer requests with one another. Father, to enjoy the fellowship of being together with our family in your presence, in this place, at this time. Father, we thank you that we live in a country that gives us the freedoms that we have to be here, to choose when and where and how we want to worship you. Father, we thank you for each and every one of those young people at Upward yesterday that heard the message that Shane brought. Father, we thank you for each and every adult and coach who over the last week have heard the gospel message and the seeds that have been planted whether it's to accept that for the first time or to take it to the next level to share it. Father, we thank you for those opportunities. Father, we thank you so much for all that you lay on our hearts, all the opportunities that you give us to share your love with those around us. Father, most of all today, we thank you for Jesus. Father, as we head into this time of Lent and And we remember the sacrifices that Jesus made for us. The sacrifice that you made sending your son to come and to die for us. Father, we are humble. We bow before you to say thank you. To say, make us the men and women that you created us to be. Father, it is out of that love and that respect that we have for Jesus that we come to you today and we pray the way he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to continue in worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings. If you're a guest with us today, just know that your presence is your present to us. We are so thankful and glad that you are here with us. Unless you're led otherwise, you don't need to feel obligated to put anything in that offering plate. So while Becky blesses us with special music, the ushers will take up the offering.
O oh Lord, we thank you for your unchanging love and grace. Lord, our awareness of our money goes up and down. And we measure our worth by how much we have. But Lord, you measure our worth by how much you would give. So we thank you for your son, Jesus, and pray that his love and grace and generosity might pour forth through us, that we might share with the whole world your good news. So use these gifts and all who gave them. Remind us of all your many blessings, far beyond what any money could purchase, and help us to serve you and love you in all our days. We pray for your wisdom for all of those charged with this money and its use. And thank you that you might be at work in us and through us now and always. For we give you thanks and praise in Christ's name and God's people said, Amen. Amen. If there are children with us who'd like to head out to Lambs, they're welcome to do so through the door over here on your right with Miss Barb. And as they do that, we'll remain standing as we sing together another hymn. We're going to sing another Charles Wesley hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling.
Good morning. That was my fault all that time, and I didn't turn my microphone on. We are glad to have you this morning as we worship together. Uh, A few notes and continued follow-up from what has been a a busy week. Uh, My thanks to Barb Ruth and all of the ladies for their work on the Wednesday meal for our Lenten lunches uh, that our ladies hosted out at St. Paul's on Wednesday. Uh, And then we followed up with a funeral meal here on Friday and our prayers and sympathies to the Schaefer family and all of those who knew and loved Clarabelle. Uh, Clarabelle uh, was last uh, here on her 100th birthday weekend, if you remember that, back in December with us. And so we rejoice with her on the other side of glory and a life well lived. Uh, Next Sunday, we turn our clocks forward, just as a note of things to come. So uh, I don't know. Let's see. If you don't do that, what happens? Do you come to the 10 o'clock service or you get here early? How does that work? You'd come at 10 instead? I never remember which. You spring forward. So it'll be darker when you get here. Just keep that in mind. Right? Because 8 o'clock will be like 9 o'clock. 8.30 8.30 be like 9.30. I've confused myself and it's not even in the sermon notes. I apologize. You spring forward next Sunday. That's the point, All right? Whatever that looks like for you. We are glad to have you this morning. We are uh, in our final two weeks of a sermon series called I Said This and You Heard That. We're using Ephesians 4.29 and so we encourage you to have memorized this verse at this point or to at least have it marked in your Bible to be mindful of God's command to do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. That instruction to us is powerful in how we relate to each other. And so we've been talking about the different ways we understand our interactions Uh, You can go to isaidyouheard.study. If if you don't know what temperament you are, if you don't know what color to choose, uh, then pick green, because I have 800 green name tags, right? Because everything I've read said the majority of folks are probably primarily green. Uh, That's that's the majority of folks. And then there are the other folks who are red and yellow and blue. And so if you don't know what you are, pick up a green, uh, just because I have lots of those name tags and I don't want you to fight over them, uh, because I'm a green, right? So uh, yellows, uh, the way that we're using this particular study, yellows are sanguines. They uh, tend to look primarily for approval and acceptance. Cholerics, the reds, uh, tend to look primarily toward ambition and independence. Uh, phlegmatics are green, look to be uh, comfortable and keep things unchanging. And melancholies are blue, they tend to uh, like things to be idealistic and are themselves more reserved. Those are four classic personality types. Uh, what can you do with that? You, you can become very uh, astute at learning to read other people, learning to understand what it is other people want. Uh, you can also use it to completely miss the mark. Uh, you can know how to market to people. You can know how to manipulate people. That's the, that's the danger side. I was, had some friends who've been to a national coffee chain recently, different, different places, and at a, a particular national coffee chain, clearly a yellow has taken charge of marketing. Because when you buy your coffee, they'll ask you questions. They'll want to engage in conversation. They'll say, now, what are, what are you doing today? Right? And if you're, if you're a yellow, you might think, this is the world's best coffee shop. They love me. I can't wait to engage in conversation, right? If you're a blue, you're never going back to that coffee shop again. You're like, just give me my coffee and leave me alone, right? If if you understand the difference of personality types, it helps you relate and love one another better. If you simply manipulate based on those personality types, you've become a a victim to your own uh, ego and knowledge, 
Uh, so how do we use these to be helpful? In these last two weeks together, I'd like to take some final steps maybe to, to look at some application or some ways we use that lens. Uh, I want to use primarily this morning the story, the parable that Jesus tells in the Gospel of Luke of a father with two sons. And I know that in your Bibles, they might call this uh, the parable of the prodigal son. That's what it called it in my Bible. I, I don't know if, if you can see this closely, but I actually, I actually crossed that out, right? That, that extra stuff that people put in your Bible, that's just editorial, right? So, so I, I actually crossed it out and I underlined verse 11 there that says Jesus continued, right? Because it's not what anybody else says that is our primary source. It's what Jesus says. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. That's how Jesus begins the parable. That's how Jesus would entitle the parable. And I want to take a look at this parable again as we think about these different personality types. Maybe as you think about the color of the name tag that you wear or the color of the name tag that the people around you wear. And Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided the property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and squandered his wealth in wild living. Uh, the, the weakness that every one of us has is found in what we would consider to be wild living. It was not that the father was unwilling to meet the son's need. In fact, the father is extravagant in his willingness to say, you know what, if you want your inheritance, I'll give it to you now. If you would prefer me dead, I will go ahead and, and give you that. It, it's an incredibly offensive request the younger son makes. Uh, but Jesus is telling this parable as the example that all of us have these places where we would prefer to go do some wild living. Not because God is unwilling to meet our needs, but because somehow our sinful nature calls us to our weaknesses. Every temperament has a temptation for separation. Uh, out there in the atrium, there's a list of strengths and weaknesses that every temperament has. If, if you don't know what's your temptation, if you don't even realize what your weaknesses are, you can't fully grasp how it is the enemy comes after you. Uh, you should get a list not only of your strengths and weaknesses, but uh, anybody that you have in your same house, anybody you work with, anybody that you are close with, you should make sure you pick up and say, what are the strengths of this person? Uh, where are the places where I should affirm them and encourage them? And where are the places where their weaknesses might shine through? Where are the places where they get tempted to take what is their natural strength and end up in a place that makes them very hard to deal with. Your temperament has a temptation for separation. And when you read this parable that Jesus tells, you can ask yourself, what is it this younger son wanted? And some of you, now here's where you get to figure out a little bit more of who you are, because whatever you think the younger son's temptation is, is the temptation that you imagine he's having, which means it probably started in your heart. Because Jesus doesn't tell us why. Some of you are going to think, well, I know, he just, he wanted more approval. He, he wanted more people to like him. He must have been a yellow. He was a sanguine. Well, that's, that's a good key as to where you think your temptations might be. Some of you are thinking, well, he just wanted to be in charge. He wanted to have the estate to himself. He thought he knew better than his father. Well, that's probably because that's where you could imagine where you would be. Some of you are thinking, well, that he probably just wanted to find some peace. He just wanted to go find himself. He wanted to go run away. He, he wasn't really looking for wild living. Wild living just came and found him. Right? You're a green, right? And some of you are thinking, well, he just, he just wanted to make things right. He just wanted to get things. He imagined that life would be so much better, that the grass would be greener on the other side of the fence, and he just slowly wandered away. That sounds very melancholy. Jesus doesn't tell us why the son went away, but he tells us a story so that we might imagine why we would run away. What is your 
weakness. What is your sinful state that causes you to find yourself separated from others? Because it doesn't matter what your temperament is, every temperament has a temptation for separation. We have to be willing to recognize our own constant battle against that desire to go off into wild living. And wild living might look differently for each one of us. But wild living nonetheless is what Jesus talks about in this parable that causes the younger son to leave. Now, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. And the younger son began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to citizens of that country who sent him to feed to the fields to feed pigs. Our temptations end up taking us to places that we didn't think we would be. We end up in some way feeding the pigs. And when Jesus told this parable to to the the Jews who were listening. Uh, The Jews were people who in the entirety of their Old Testament law uh, knew that eating pigs was not allowed, that pigs were the lowest form of animal for them. And so this image of having to feed pigs is to be in the place where you would least want to be. And no matter what your temperament is, it is the sign of ultimate failure. Whatever your temperament would imagine to be the worst possible place is where your sinful nature leads you. If you're a yellow looking for approval and acceptance, that desire to go be a part of the popular crowd ends up leaving you all alone, the very thing you didn't want. If your desire is to be in control That sinful desire taken to the utmost part leaves you in control of nothing. If your desire is to make peace and to have everything be just calm and harmonious, ends up leaving you in the middle of a fight. If your desire is to have everything perfect and in order, there could be no worse place than the middle of a messy pig pen. The challenges in life that we face are often the very things that we've been running away from. But in our desire to get what we want, we end up where we don't want to be. That's our sinful nature. That's understanding the strengths of your temperament, what you really want, and then in your weaknesses, ending up where you didn't want to be. The younger son is then feeding pigs. For a sanguine, it would look like ending up with rebellion and rejection. For the choleric, ending up full of your ego and then alienated. For the phlegmatic, it would end up being all cynical and complacent. For the melancholy, it would be full of pride and then feeling persecuted. Understanding how our different temperaments react, understanding how our temperaments work helps us relate not only better to others when they are angry or frustrated, but it helps us understand ourselves in our constant battle with sin. It helps us deepen our prayer life when we know, Lord, I need to pray about those things that would most call my heart away from you. And so what happens to us? He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. For those folks out there who are caught in those pig pens, for uh, people who don't know God, who are lost in a sinful life, they, they end up wanting the love and acceptance that we talk about in church. But you can feel like nobody gives you anything. The very things that you want seem out of your grasp. Uh, We have six weeks from now until Resurrection Sunday. What I liked best about today was the sunrise. About 6.30, the sun came up over the horizon. Man, it was gorgeous. Next week, it's going to happen at 7.30 because we spring forward. I'm still working that out. Uh, We're going to have sunrise. No, 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 no. Right, we turn our clocks forward so the sunrise will be earlier. Oh, man, 
just work this, stop talking about it, Jim. Just work it out after service. Really bugs me. Whatever the case may be, in six weeks, we've got sunrise service, which will be at seven o'clock, whatever time that is. And the church will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And that sense that this life is not all that there is, is at the very heart of our mortal struggle. The idea that we face all of the challenges of this life, not simply to, to wear us out, but to prepare us for what is to come. Oh, Clarabelle was nine years old when the Great Depression started. Clarabelle was one year old when they elected uh, Warren G. Harding, president from Marion. Right? That hardly, that you hardly even think of that as a real thing. On the day before her 22nd birthday, Pearl Harbor got bombed. The ability to face all of the challenges of life and to continue to live in faith and with joy Oh, don't underestimate the example that you leave behind you. Don't underestimate that sometimes the challenges that you've overcome aren't just for you, it's for those who will follow you as well. There are people desperate living in the pig pens of life who don't feel like anybody would give them anything. And maybe, let me just say a word, that might be you today. It might be someone you speak to today. And God has to do a work in our heart. When he felt like no one had given him anything, when he had achieved all that he thought he wanted and then found himself where he didn't want to be, in verse 17 it says, he came to his senses. His temperament didn't make any difference at all in this moment. Regardless of how God has wired you, your sinful nature has taken you away from him at some place at some time. And in, in that moment, you have to decide to come to your senses. You have to open your ears and open your heart to the call of the Holy Spirit. You have to be prepared to say, God, I am not where I want to be. Now, did the younger son say, well, it's not my fault, it's my temperament, it's just the way I'm wired, it's my personality? No. What the younger son does is a, a radical reconsideration of the relationship he has with his father. When he came to his senses... He said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. The younger son, in that moment of repentance, decides the most important question to ask is not what do I need, but rather, how can I serve the Father? He decided, no longer am I going to let any unwholesome talk come out of my mouth, but rather, what I say is going to be for the building up of my Father according to His needs. That's what happens if you've really repented. If you've really repented, you come to a radical reconsideration of the relationship you have with others. You don't go back and say, you know what, I've been thinking about the fact that you didn't meet my needs. You don't go back and say, you know what, I'd like to explain to you my temperament because you've obviously not understood me. You don't go back and say, you know what, I'm, I was spending some time in the pig pen and I figured out that it's all your fault. That's the danger. That's, that's the danger because that's where we go rather than getting to the root of that radical nature when the younger son discovers that all that he had wanted was a mistake, when he sees that the result of what's happened to him, he says, you know what, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to change the relationship. I'm going to ask my father, Father, what do you need? If, if you think you've been acting 
in repentance, if you think you've been acting as a forgiven person, I want to challenge you to say, have you gone to a place where you then went back to God and say, God, what do you need of me? How can I be your servant? Have you gone back to that person that you know that you sinned against and said, what do you need? How can I serve you? You see, when you come to know Jesus, you recognize your willingness to obey what he calls us to do. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. The point of knowing each other's temperaments is to love one another better. Marketers, public relation people, advertisers want to know your temperament. They want to know your temperament so they can sell you stuff, so they can advertise to you in a way that meets your needs. But church, our desire to know one another better is not to manipulate. When you start to take note of the others around you, it is not to figure out how you can simply say the right words to them. It is to figure out how you can build them up according to their needs because you love them. If I don't get anything else out of, out of today and all our name tags, I, I finally got Brett's name. Brett comes early every Sunday. I see Brett at work. And man, Brett, I am so glad you made a name tag today because my, like my only prayer today is like, Lord, I want to make sure I know his name. Because I love him. I love that he comes. I love that, he hard, that he's a hard worker. I love that I see him out in the community. But Lord, I want to love him enough to make sure I know Brett's name. Oh, it just makes me glad to know it. I say it several times because I want to make sure it sinks into my head. That's how you get to know one another's names. Right? To know one another's name and to know one another well enough to speak to each other in ways that build each other's up is because we love one another. We love one another even as Christ has loved us. Uh, in a few weeks when we get to that sunrise service, we'll read the gospel where Jesus is in the garden and, and Mary comes to him and she says, thinking he's the gardener, where have you put his body? Just tell me and I'll go find it. And Jesus says to her, Mary, a name has great power. So you don't have to hug one another or shake hands overly today, but I do want to make sure if, if you don't know somebody's name, and boy, isn't that hard to do? Isn't it hard to make sure you know people's names? I want to make sure you take time to say hello to somebody, at least get to know their name a little bit better, that we might love one another. The younger son went back to his father and said to his father, I've sinned. There, there's no temperament that makes that easy. There's no place where it's easy to say, I've sinned. It, it's a little bit easier if I tell you it's your weakness. That's part of the secret. Right? If you want to call it a weakness, just pick up a sheet and say, Lord, here are my weaknesses. And eventually you'll be able to recognize where those weaknesses lead us to sin. And what does the Father do? Here's, here's, here's the first just radical moment of this new relationship. But while he was still a long way off, the Father saw him, was filled with compassion for him, and ran to his Son. You see, God meets our greatest needs. Whatever your temperament is, and some of you, I know some of you, Shane's got two name tags on today because Shane's like, listen, I'm a little bit of both. Some of you are like, listen, I'm all four name tags. I like all four of those things, right? But and that, that, that's okay. Sometimes we operate out of different temperaments. Sometimes depending where we are or what kind of pressure or stress we're under, we can change which, which strengths and weaknesses we operate out of. But no matter what strength or weakness you're operating out of, God's desire is to meet your greatest need. 
Not only do you need to know your weaknesses so you can see your sins, you also need to be able to say, God, where are my needs? How, what strengths do I want that I need? And so in light of that, the father ran to him. In a healthy relationship, forgiveness changes that relationship to such a degree that the, the spirit within you, God's Holy Spirit meets you in that moment of repentance. Your willingness to serve is transformed into joyful obedience. If you simply ask for forgiveness and then go right back to your wicked living and your wild ways, you have missed all that repentance is supposed to mean to us. If you know, if you know that other person's temperament. In that relationship, when one comes to ask for forgiveness and the other has to be willing to give forgiveness, you have to decide, Lord, can I act out of love? Can I be sensitive to their needs? Am I willing to create connection? That's what knowing these temperaments can do as we finish these last two weeks out together to understand what we do with them. But it's not the end of the story. And so I want to make sure we get to the older brother as well, because Jesus tells a parable of a man who had two sons. The father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robes and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. This son of mine was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Oh, the the yellows were ecstatic that there was a party. The reds were excited that the father was back in charge. The greens were delighted that everything was now harmonious again with the younger son. Uh, The blues excited that everything was now detailed and in its place as it should be. But not all is well. Verse 26, verse 25, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. He answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I've never disobeyed your orders. And yet you've never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's where Jesus ends the parable. We don't know what the older brother does. It again leaves us thinking, how would I react? The father knows everything about his two sons. It was not enough to keep the younger son from running away, and it was not enough to immediately get the older son to come to the party. Even if you know your temperament, even if you know the temperament of others, it is only a tool to better understand. It is not a magic fix. The older brother might have felt offended. He got no credit. He might have felt like the father was giving someone else all the attention. He might have felt a lack of respect. He might have felt completely unsupported. Can't you see all of that in his reply? Can you see all of the struggle the older brother has? Oh, let me tell you, if you're in church long enough, listen, if you're in church long enough, we, let me use we, we become the older brother. Without a softened heart, we become offended by the sinful life the world is living. And the extravagant grace that God continues to give. What does the father say to the younger brother? To the older, to the older brother? 
My son, the father says, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. There is nothing more the father could do for the older son. There is nothing more that he could offer. He offered him his affection. He offered him complete loyalty. He offered him the whole of the worth. He offered him complete safety. God speaks to our deepest needs. Our ability to speak to one another's needs is a biblical command to understand what each other are looking for. Grace humbled and restored the sinner. In those moments of our sinful behavior, we have to be changed. Repentance has to not simply give us a sense of relief, it has to give us a sense of going the other direction. When that happens, the Father celebrates. When you've been a sinner and you've come to the Lord and said, Lord, forgive me, change me, let me know how to serve you, the Father throws a party. You go to that party and you are excited to be there. You're like, Lord, let me just show me how to serve. Show me how to serve. Some of you know what that looks like. That's why we end up with uh, funeral meals and chairs going up and down and upward basketball and singing and praising on Sunday morning because your life has been changed. All of you in this room, that's my guess, all of you in this room are testimony to that. Praise God. The Father also humbles himself and invites the offended. The Father went out to the older brother and pleaded with him. God did not have to run to the sinner, and he does not have to plead with the self righteous. But he does. When we grasp what God would do for us, it is overwhelming. Forgiving is not easy while you're still hurting. The older brother is still hurting when the father goes to him. And so the parable ends in this moment of invitation. This reality of the younger brother's transformation and the offer to the older brother to be part of what the father is now doing. Uh, This desire to have better relationships with one another is the heart of our study. Uh, The I said this, you heard that, it's fascinating. Temperaments are incredibly powerful. We'll talk more about it next week. But the goal of all of that is not simply to know your color. It is to learn how to love one another better. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this All will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In these next six weeks, as we move towards the celebration of the resurrection, it is the tradition of Christians to figure out, Lord, what could I give up? For some to also say, what can I do more of? But for all of us to say, Lord, help me serve you. Thank you for inviting me to the party. Let me pray for us. And so, God, I thank you for the ways that you've made us to reflect your image. God, we repent in those places where we sin. God, we pray in the midst of our relationships with one another and therefore our witness to the whole community that you might help us know what it is to follow your command. We pray we might reflect deeper and be prepared in a richer way to understand the depth of the beauty and love of the cross. And that in our hearts, we might feel overwhelmed again at the miracle of that empty tomb, the witness of your resurrection, and the presence of your Holy Spirit now alive in your people. We give you thanks and praise and lift it all up in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.
As always, the altar rails are open if you'd like to come and pray. We'll stand and sing our final hymn together, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. No matter what happens, move your clock forward next week. (laughs) May God be at work in you to fulfill your strengths and forgive your sins. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace from this day forward until we all meet again. Amen. Amen.